What an absolute pleasure it is to be with you this morning and to have this opportunity. I did mention, uh, forget to mention two very important announcements. Uh, and I don't want to wait until next week because the, uh, the Lewis family is out this weekend. But uh, some of you are already aware, we have two new brothers in Christ. Uh, Enoch and Ian, the, the two middle children of the Lewis family, were both baptized this past weekend. So uh, wonderful news. We have two brothers. They are gone this weekend. But uh, we will certainly celebrate next weekend when they are back in town. So uh, keep that in mind. And certainly, as you see them, congratulate them, encourage them, pray for them uh, as they begin their new walks. I'd like to begin our service this morning, our, our message this morning, with an illustration. Some of you this will relate better to maybe than others. But there was an old man and he was sitting on his front porch uh, enjoying the sunrise. With him were his five trusty dogs laying on the front porch just soaking up the morning sun. Suddenly one of the five dogs, ears shot straight up, let out a bark, took off running as quick as it could off the side of the porch. Now as you would imagine this startled the other four dogs who jump up, take off running after the first dog. The old man watched for several minutes as one after the next, the four dogs that took off last, came slowly walking back, tail between their legs, tongue hanging out, just deflated. Several minutes after that, the first dog that took off running came back, only this dog had a rabbit in his mouth. Why did the four return with a defeated manner, with a defeated demeanor? The four that went second never saw what they were chasing after. They only saw the first dog take off. They decided to follow him instead. But only the first dog saw the prize, came back with the reward for seeing it. So to begin this morning, I'm going to ask you a question that's kind of tough. Some of you are going to want to answer the question. Why are you here? Not why are you here in this life, why are you in the flesh, why are you here today? Why are you sitting in the pew you're sitting in right now? Assembled together, hopefully Bible in hand, why are you here? Better yet, who in here can say for certainty exactly what you're chasing after in life? You see the prize ahead, you're, you're taken off wide open after that prize. Or are you one of the four that's following the first that, that took off with no real clue as to what you're chasing after? It's just good enough for them, so it's good enough for me as well. Now, we're in church. We're here to worship God. The answer is pretty simple. We're going to talk today about following Jesus. That's my hope for you today is you're here to follow Jesus, to seek our Lord in every aspect of your life, striving to honor Him in every single thing you do because there is only one word. You go back to Colossians chapter 1, which is where we're going to be this morning. You're going to go ahead and turn there. Paul tells us that the Lord is the only one worthy because He is God. He is the creator of the universe, the sustainer of the universe, the one holding the very fabric of our being together. So he is the only one worthy of praise. Which led last week to the hopefully soul-searching question, who are you then? If that's who Jesus is, who are you in Jesus? Who are you chasing? Who are you following after? Your answer to those two questions is the difference between eternal life and eternal death. It's not a playful question. Not a simple question. To anyone that has made that decision, we come to yet another important question. Is it worth it? Write that question down on top of your note sheet. Is it worth it to follow Jesus Christ? Is it worth it to live to the calling that the Lord has called for you? Is it worth it to put on that badge that every one of us likes to put on, this shiny badge that says Christian. Is it worth it? You go on vacation. Let's say you, you take a cruise somewhere and you, you go off to the Bahamas. You come back. You're excited to tell your friends about it. You're telling your family about it. What's one of the first questions they ask you? Was it worth the cost? Was 
it enough, did, did you enjoy it enough to offset the cost and the effort to go on that trip? Some of you need to come to this reality. There is a cost to follow Jesus. There is a cost to be a sincere Christian. And oh, he, You'll throw your hand, oh, I know, I know, the Bible says I have to take up my cross daily with no clue what that means. Somebody will, will, will make the arrogance say, oh, well, my cross is this co-worker i got to deal with, or my cross is, is I have sleep problems, or sometimes I just can't get up and go to it. That's not your cross. That's just a daily burden you have to deal with. Your cross is talking about eternal matters. So people say that also, well, I have to take up my cross with no clue as to what it looks like and what the potential outcome could be of being a follower of Jesus Christ. Now we're in Colossians this morning. We're continuing our study here. Still in chapter 1. Before we get to our text in Colossians, I want to take a couple minutes to look at the author. I want you to think about the Apostle Paul for a minute. He's going to be a topic tonight in the study as well. But I want you to think about a very prominent man, a man headed in a very great direction as far as he would say. He's a shoe-in to being the Sanhedrin. He's a possibility of being the high priest, maybe. He's an up-and-comer Pharisee. He takes off all to Damascus with his goal set, his mind like, it, like he believed it should be. He's going to enter the city as somebody special. He's going to come into the city with power. With, with authority, with prominence. He is a guy. He's the guy. Until it all changes. Life changes when you meet the Lord. That's when life truly changes. Now he enters the city, a broken man, being blinded, being guided by hand, by the rest of them with him, making the decision that I am going to follow Christ. I'm going to take up my cross. You think, well, all that... That means he might stub his toe occasionally, or he might have a headache he's got to deal with, or he might miss a meal if he goes out on one of his journeys. Let's see, Paul's going to be persecuted by his former friends. He's going to be rejected by Christians as he comes into Jerusalem. He's going to be let down a wall to escape imminent death. He's going to be shipwrecked, he's going to be beaten, he's going to be cast into prison, and he is going to be executed. And, and taking up your cross is a stub toe or a headache. And I wonder if you could go back in time and you could ask Paul, Paul, was it worth it? Was it worth it to follow Christ? Was it worth it to submit your life to Him, to put on your Christian badge? I wonder what he'd say. You see, before we get to Colossians, I'm going to read a passage out of 1 Corinthians 15 for you. I'm going to read it. You can jot down the passage if you'd like. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 9 and 10. Paul wrote to Corinth, For I am the least of the apostles who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace towards me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than all of them, Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Paul, is it worth it to be a Christian? Of course it's worth it. He says, I'm not even worthy to be an apostle. I am what I am today only because of the grace of God. If you want to know why you're here today, let's begin with that. The grace of God is front and center. He wore the title of apostle proudly and faithfully. But he answered the question, Paul, is it worth it? Now in Colossians, he's going to answer the question again. Let me ask you a silly question. If he keeps answering the question, what question do you think he keeps getting asked? He answers this over and over and over again. And the Colossians are asking the same question. False teachers on this side. Jews hounding them on this side. Paul, is it worth it to follow Christ? Is it worth it to give up your old life, give up the fun parts, uh, go through beatings, go through persecutions? Is it enough to make you reconsider? Notice his answer as we get into our text in Colossians. Colossians 1, verse 24. Here's Paul's answer. Paul, is it worth it? 
I now rejoice in my sufferings for you. And I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of His body, which is the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God which was given to me for you to fulfill the Word of God, the mystery which has been hidden from all ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to His saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I labor, striving according to His working, which works in me mightily. Look at it through eyes of a Christian today. And answer the question for Paul. Paul, is it worth it? Paul, if you're really an apostle and it's really worth it, and you're really called by God, why are you in prison? Why is your life constantly in danger? Surely this can't be worth it. Well, we don't have to wonder. Paul breaks this section down perfectly for us. Notice his attitude. How does he begin verse 24? Well, I just I deal with my sufferings. I mean, I, I'm like everybody. I take the good days. I take the bad days. What does he say? I rejoice in my sufferings. Paul, are you so spiritual now that you're above all these things? Is, is that what you're telling me? You're so spiritual that the comforts of life don't matter to you anymore. Life's blessings don't matter anymore. Your, your family, your friends don't matter anymore. Prioritizing God in your life is all that really matters to you. Is, are you above it all? That's not what he said. You don't think Paul loved people? You don't think Paul loved his family? You don't think Paul enjoyed the beauties of this world? In fact, uh, people will say this, you have to give up so much. You'll never experience beauty like you do when you become a Christian. So you can go out and look at a sunrise, and when you go out and you look at that same sunrise to the eyes of someone looking to God, it's never more beautiful than it is then. That's when you recognize the source of it all. I want you to write down two words. These are very important words. Joyful sacrifice. I know, listen, I get it. You hear the word sacrifice, and probably a third of your ears just shut off. Whoa, you said the S word. You said sacrifice. Joyful sacrifice means you're willing to give up something you love something you love even more. Something that matters even more to you than what that first thing was. Listen, look, be honest with you. Do you think Paul would have preferred to not be in prison? Who wants to go to prison? Do you think he would have loved to be free from his, his chains and his shackles and to go where he pleased, when he pleased, and receive high fives instead of punches everywhere he went? But Paul loved seeing people come to Christ more than he loved his own suffering. His love for Christ, the redeeming power of his blood, is what drove the Apostle Paul. Now, I quickly mentioned this verse last week, Hebrews 12, verse 2. But I mentioned it with the expectation and anticipation of coming back to it this week. Hebrews 12, verse 2, I've got it up on the screen for you now so you can look at it. In Hebrews 12, the, the, the Hebrews author is encouraging Christians to run, run their Christian race. Run with endurance your race. There's such a, a great cloud of witnesses why you run with faith. Run with endurance. Notice what he says in verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Now listen to just this ridiculous statement the Hebrews author adds next. Who, talking about Christ, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Here's a question for you. Why would this be a joyful thing? The cross is despised. The cross is a, a horrible reminder of death. It is the most excruciating punishment 
one could suffer. Yet we're told that Jesus went to the cross in joy. Now here's my question. Did he just lose it in those final moments? Did the stress get to Jesus where he just finally snapped? Why would he go to the cross in joy? Joyful sacrifice. Jesus did this with joy. Because in that moment, he reversed what took place in the Garden of Eden. When man did what man does best, we messed it up. Jesus flipped it back upright, crushed the head of Satan, destroyed Satan's plan, which if you're not aware of Satan's plan, it's to destroy you. He made it so that you are no longer, you can no longer be an enemy of God in His sacrifice. In fact, you can be adopted into His family through that sacrifice. That's the only reason His horrible death was received with joy. He saw the other side of it. And I was trying to think, what's, what's the most, the, the closest we could come to relating to this? The only example I could come up with was a mother. Uh, go back to the moment of childbirth. A lot of you don't want to go back to that moment of childbirth. Imagine the, the pre epidural days of childbirth. You go from excruciating pain to immense joy when you first hold the baby. Fortunately, they grow up and you're kind of back to immense pain. But um, you go through that whole experience. And mothers are the closest I can come to relating to it, an incredible amount of pain for the joy that offsets every bit of pain. Because if you ask a mother, would you do it again? Nine times out of ten, they would say yes. Maybe not for all the kids, but for most of them, we would do it again. Paul, is it worth it? Is it worth it to be a Christian? So Paul, and I want you to listen to this, and this is how you should act too. You say, well, why are you talking about Paul? Well, Paul was a, an inspired apostle who said, follow me as I follow Christ. It was worth it to Paul to suffer every single minute if it meant that you would come to know who Jesus was. That's how he lived his life. He gave up something he loved for something he loved even more. Joyful sacrifice. Verse 24, he says, I rejoice in my sufferings, but now notice this. I want you to notice this bombshell of a statement that he adds to close out verse 24. He says, And I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of His body, which is the church. What could possibly be lacking in Christ's afflictions? Does this mean that his afflictions didn't quite go far enough? What did Jesus say on the cross? I told you we had a, this was a big part of a lesson months ago. The only Greek word I, I truly care that you remember is that word to tell us die. It is finished. I don't care if you don't remember a single other Greek word I ever tell you, but that one, to tell us die, it is finished. He didn't say it's almost finished. He didn't say I came up just short. It's finished. So if it's finished, what is lacking in his sacrifice? The lacking is not on the part of Jesus. The lacking is on the part of every one of us. One theologian said, it wouldn't matter if Jesus died a thousand times if nobody ever heard about him. Another said, the gospel is only good news if it makes it to the lost soul in time. You see, the only thing lacking in Jesus' sacrifice in this bombshell of a statement is on the part of the hearer. One that will actually listen, take it in, believe, submit to Him. So Paul answers the question. Paul, is it worth it? Everything you've been through to follow Jesus Christ wasn't worth it. He says, I rejoice in my suffering because I'm working to, to close the gap and what's lacking in a person's faith. Notice what Paul says his charge is. We're not going to read all these passages again. But he says that I became a minister according to the stewardship from God. That's what was given to me 
to fulfill the word of God. He talks about this mystery that's been hidden from the ages and from generations. So what's his charge? He says, you know, yes, this is important to me. That's why I became a minister. Again, looking at some of these literal words, it means servant. Giving up one's own rights to serve someone else. God knocked Paul to the ground to give him this service. God came to Moses in the burning bush to give him this service. God came to Gideon hiding in the threshing floor to give him this service. Wherever you met the Lord in your life, that's where He gave you this service. It doesn't have to be some dramatic fashion. It could be a, a teenager sitting in a pew that hears a fiery lesson and, and hits adulthood, runs as far away from church as they can only to come back later on. That's my story. It, it could come to you however your story comes about. A person struggling with life, struggling with faith, that it has to hit rock bottom before you have your moment with Jesus Christ. It doesn't have to be a miraculous thing. It's that, that intersection of faith and passion with what the world needs from the cross today. That's the moment that builds the here. Paul says, if I have to spend time in prison for a soul to be saved, then that's fine. Here's the hardest reality you'll ever have to come to understand. He says, it's not about me. It's not about me. If I have to be in prison so someone can hear it, that's fine. The mission was given to me for you. Not about me. So I love seeing this change throughout Paul's life. And it's a great lesson in itself because Paul goes from Pharisee to Apostle. But there's even a change in his apostleship. Early on, Paul was a debater. In fact, I have people that accuse me of this of all the time. That I, I love to debate people, and, and I do it. I shouldn't be as excitable and bad as I am. But somebody will come up and ask me a Bible question. Next thing I know, we're there for two hours. But Paul went from being an apostle that would sit and debate with Jews and, and debate with Pharisees and debate, debate with anybody to Romans 15 where he says, I'd rather go to a place that's never heard about Jesus than go to a church. That's his calling. That's his charge. Does it do you any good to know what Paul's charge is? What's your charge today? What is your charge as a Christian today? I want you to make this personal. Ask yourself this question. What does God expect from you today? If you throw your hand up and say, nothing, God wants me to be happy, that doesn't even crack the top ten. What does God expect from you? What God wants from you is the same thing that He wanted from Paul. The gospel message that eternally saved your soul will save the next soul if you're faithful enough to tell them about it. You'll say, well, God loves me so much, and He does. But He loves that person sitting beside you just as much as He loves you. He loves that person out on the street that you bump into just as much as He loves you. And if you truly understand the power of the gospel, you would share that message. Micah 6.8, the prophet there wrote, he has, uh, he has shown you, O oh man, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God? What does God expect from you? Do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Where does it start? It starts with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul describes this, and again, in another interesting way. He says, this mystery, this book, he said, this, this mystery, no one knew. You didn't have the pieces of the puzzle. He said, now it's been revealed. And so I was thinking about it, and I was going to just kind of blow right past this. What is the mystery of the gospel? What is, what is the mystery of the Bible? You hear about this. The mystery was revealed. And I started thinking about this. I wonder how many Christians can answer the question, what is the mystery? What is the mystery revealed? We go back to Genesis chapter 22. God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, 
Through your seed, all nations are going to be blessed. And they have no clue how. Well, that's great, but, but how? He goes to offer Isaac. Well, you're going to bless my name. How can I offer him? I won't, I won't be able to bless the nations. He has no clue. That's the mystery. Prophecy after prophecy after prophecy revealed a Messiah, a, a Savior. But if you've learned anything in the Gospel of Mark, what have you learned that we've been studying on Sunday mornings? They have no clue. They have no clue what this is about. The Jews are looking for a Savior. They're looking for David. Someone that's going to fight for them. What do they get instead? A Savior that's going to die, not live? So that you can live and not die? What in the world? Add to this the fact that the mind-blowing fact for any Jew that would read this, that it's not just for the Jew. It's for the Gentiles. It's for the Greek. It, it's for every single person. That's the mystery revealed that God came to save everybody. The only mystery that remains today is when He's going to come again. That's the only remaining mystery. Do you understand that Christians, we cling to the fact that Christ died for us? You'll say that so much. It's the central theme of our faith, but don't, don't miss the revelation of these passages. Christ didn't just die for you. If you are a sincere Christian, Christ now lives in you. <clears throat> There's no mystery in it. That's why Paul says, To them God will to make known the mystery, the saving power of God to all mankind. Finally this morning, let's go ahead and jump to our third point. I'm losing track of time. I want you to notice Paul's purpose. Verse 28. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. To this end I also labor, striving according to His working which works in me mightily. Paul says, Why are you here? I asked you that question to start the service this morning. Why are you here today? What do you hope to gain today? Paul's purpose is not a program. It's not an event. It's not a day that you wake up early and you put on nicer clothes so that you can follow other people into a building because that's what you do on Sundays. That's, that's what the four dogs do that chase the one dog. He says his purpose. Paul's singular purpose in life is to preach the gospel in the singular hopes of presenting every soul perfect before Jesus Christ. That wraps up the entire Christian system in that statement. That's what the gospel does when the faithful speak. This, this reminds me of a George Whitfield quote. It said, Other men may preach the gospel better, but no man will ever preach a better gospel. What was his purpose? What was his goal in life? Because I want to present everybody, everyone, a perfect example. You know who's included in everybody? That person you don't like. That person you ignore. The person you see going down the street. The person you bump into at Walmart. The people you see on TV, that's somebody that Paul cared about and says, this is who I'm trying to present perfect before God. Every person you meet is somebody God loves just as much as He loves you. And they need the gospel just as much as you do, just as much as you did. You have to decide if it's worth it. Is it worth it? In fact, that's my last question today. You've heard about being Christian so long, being a Christian so long, so much, it becomes second nature. You think about it, you hear taking up your cross, we don't think about what that means. You hear persecution, we're in a country, you're not going to be persecuted. Uh, 
Worst thing that might happen is somebody might hurt your feelings. Is being a Christian worth it? Knowing what Paul just said. To him it was. To him the beatings were worth it. To him the prison time was worth it. Is sharing the gospel worth it to you? <laughs> I, I, I read a lot of these articles and they're, they're tied to uh, sermon illustrations like the, the five dogs. Uh, and I want to tell you about a woman that thought it was worth it. And what this, this old woman, this old French woman, I don't know her name, I don't know, I don't know where this took place. But it's basically it's a true story. And this old woman is about to remove every excuse you've come up with in your life to say, well, I can't do what Paul does. This woman couldn't read. She couldn't read very well. I say she probably could read something. She couldn't read. But she had heard the gospel, been taught the gospel. The gospel impacted her. And she sat there with the same decision you make all the time to say, I can't really talk. I don't, I don't know enough. I'm not educated enough. I can't, I can't do what Paul does. There's no way I'm going to be able to present anybody perfect in Christ Jesus. Nothing I can do about it. This, this little French lady that couldn't hardly read asked somebody one day, Hey, can you, can you turn to my Bible? And can you underline John 3.16 for me? And they did. And she put a marker in the Bible exactly where it was. This little old lady would then go up to people and ask them, say, listen, I can't read very well. Can you, can you tell me what this passage says? They would read for her John 3.16, and she would go immediately into talking to them about the gospel. speak eloquently enough. You don't know who you're going to walk up to. I mean, some strangers are crazy. What if they say something mean? They might hurt my feelings. Do you, do you understand how much this little old French woman puts every Christian to shame today? Is it worth it? Mark chapter 8, Jesus asked one of the most important questions. And if you were here for our Bible study, you heard the question. Jesus asked him, says, what will a man trade for his soul? In other words, what's the worth of a soul? It all boils down to worth. Every question in life boils down to worth. Do you understand by sheer number alone. Someone in this room today is a stranger to God. They've not placed their hope in Him. They, they've said so far, no, it's not worth it. And if you go back to what Paul just said in the previous verses, you through your wicked works are alienated from God. And for what? What was the word of making all of these decisions when He's made the cost for you? So I pray today in closing that you search your hearts, you understand the true worth of salvation. If somebody says, listen, is it worth it for you to be a Christian? You say, you better believe it is. Because I can't express to you what my soul is worth. So I want you to think about that question this morning. Is it worth it? And the bigger question I go back to is, why are you here today? Jesse's going to lead us in an invitation song here in just a moment. And as he does that, I want you to search your heart. I want you to answer just those questions for yourself. Not for me. Answer that question for yourself, why are you here today? And is your soul worth it? However we can help you this morning, I want to encourage you as we have this invitation song to come forward if you need to answer the gospel call, if you're ready to repent, confess the name of Jesus Christ, be baptized for the remission of your sins, or if you just need the prayers of the congregation, however we can help you. Don't miss this opportunity as Jesse leads us in this song.